Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of our lives, how we all should embrace science, love the evidence-based nature of it, and uh, take home lessons, use them in our daily lives. And I've got a really great guest today, Makana Rissarshai. Welcome, Makana. Thank you. And she has written a wonderful book called Be Fit in No Time. Uh, and we're going to talk about this book. It is filled with great information that is, I, when I read it, it was just like, it fits so well with the show's theme. It, it's good science-based advice, but it's very accessible. It's very applicable. People can use it, pick it up, and just, boom, run with it right away. Huh? <laughs> I hope so, yeah. <laughs> That's the point. Let's, let's just jump in right away to your, your sort of a central idea on this, uh, what, what, what you call mindful multitasking. Now, multitasking has sort of deservedly a really a, a bad rep, right? Exactly, right. Yeah, when we think of multitasking, we usually think about texting while driving right. or uh, listening to a meeting while you're doing your email at the same time. But that's not really multitasking huh. because both of those activities require you to think, and you can't think about two things at once. Right. So what you're really doing is task switching right. from the meeting to the email, meeting to email. With mindful multitasking, I'm not asking you to think about two things at once. Right, you're doing one on sort of a, almost a subconscious level. Exactly. And, uh, thinking about the other. And whether the exercise is in the foreground or the exercise is in the background, you can do it either way, right? Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, uh, the, the other uh, multitasking, the way it's commonly used, of course, you, as you say, you're involved in task switching, which is terribly inefficient, right? You, you spend a lot of time sort of mentally letting go of one thing, mentally getting up to speed on the other. Exactly. Even though we don't think of that as taking up time, it does take time, it takes energy, and it takes concentration. Right. And then when you're doing the one thing, because you are doing it, you're not, you know, you're losing track of the other. Right, right. So, so it really is, it's a, you know, you're doing two things poorly instead of one thing well. But this is very different. Right, so an example is actually two types of mindful multitasking. Right. So one is where you're not actually doing anything anyway. You're waiting for the microwave, the toaster, the coffee maker. So while you're waiting, you can do squats mm -hmm. or push-ups or balance on one foot uh, mm -hmm. because balance is so important as we get older. So that's one category. Another category is where you do have to pay attention. For example, you're driving, but what I'm asking you to do doesn't take your attention away from the driving. So for example, you can sing upbeat songs. Right or you can listen to comedy. Right. Or do deep breathing. Deep, do deep right. breathing, yeah, there's all kinds of things. There's so many things you could do in the car, it's amazing. Right. Yeah. yeah, and you have, what, 34 different exercises in here, divided into ones for physical fitness, for sort of mental health, uh, emotional well-being, and even a whole category on, on spiritual uplifting, right? Right, yeah, because you know, the medical research shows that all four of those are important to have a long, healthy, and happy life. Right. So we, a lot of people think of physical exercise as just to lose weight, but that's like its least important aspect. Mm -hmm. And then mental wellness is about keeping our minds active and, and not getting depressed or um, negative. Right. The emotional is about connecting to others because emotional connection actually is the biggest indicator for a long life. Right. And then connecting to the divine has also been correlated with longer, healthier, happier lives. Yeah, this ties in neatly to the Blue Zones projects. Yes. You know, where they, they find in these communities around the world where people live long, healthy lives, they've got all these things going for them. They're typically physically, physically active, they are mentally active, they're connected into their communities with a sense of purpose, drive. I mean, so, I mean it really fits these same categories rather neatly. Right, and you know, there's, I think there's so much science and research and projects being done, and it gets kind of overwhelming. So what I wanted to do was to create a really small book, a narrow book, right. that um, just has 34 techniques in it that are very accessible, very easy to do, and you can just kind of go one by one. One of my readers said that she puts it on her kitchen table and she just opens it at random every morning and does that thing that day. Oh, great. What, what I thought was great is some of these things resonated with me and rang a bell because they're things I'm already doing. And so it's like, oh, well, cool. I'm already sort of 
you know, I've, I'm halfway through it here, or, <laughs> or, or whatever. You know, I've gotten a start on it, so picking up new parts of it is just like adding on to the repertoire of things I'm already doing. It's not sort of starting a whole new program in a sense. And so I found I found that a very appealing aspect. Oh, good. But here's my question for you. This this is really odd because Makani, you are an attorney by training. You spent years in the corporate world. You were a consultant. You wrote. Uh, you wrote a book on Stay Out of Court, The Manager's Guide to uh, Preventing Employee Lawsuits. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is very different. <laughs> so something happened here to, to shift you from one course in life to another. And, and oh, well, yes. I uh, ended up in the hospital because of my stressful lifestyle. Ooh. And the doctor said, change your life or you will die. Wow. So from that, I decided to go to massage school, become a certified stress and wellness consultant with the Canadian Institute of Stress and also moved to Hawaii mm -hmm. uh, because I'd always wanted to live in Hawaii so I thought if I'm gonna die I might as well die here <laughs> but uh, it's been almost 20 years I'm huh? still here so um, and then I became a certified instructor in Pilates and yoga mm -hmm. so I've been pursuing fitness for quite a while. No, that, that's great and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful sort of testament to uh, saying you, you've got credentials for this, right? <laughs> you, I do you, have some you, you credentials. You have become fit, you know, uh, and that's that's really that's nice to to see you're living it out, you know. So um, may, maybe you talk to the to the audience just a little bit about about sort of what uh, how you might start some of these start getting into this routine or one of these routines. Okay, well, I think one good way to do it is to start with asking yourself what is your area that you want to work on because there's a physical mental emotional and spiritual and i think most of us have most of these things more or less under control most of the time mm -hmm. but there's usually one that's an issue uh, for me for many many years it was the physical that i just didn't exercise and i i know i just said that i taught pilates and yoga for eight years but the reason I taught that was because I would not have done the exercises by myself. You know, I had to force myself to be there. Um, but if physical exercise is the issue, then you know, start with physical and just look at what's in there and pick one. Maybe that appeals to you and try that. And then maybe that will lead to another one or another one. Or another way of looking at physical is do you have an issue? For example, a lot of people have low back pain. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is because we don't have strong abs. So um, an exercise anybody can do anytime, sitting, standing, lying in bed, is working their abs. And in Pilates what we teach is that you imagine there's a fish hook behind your navel and it's pulling towards your spine and down towards the floor. So you're pulling towards the, your back and towards the floor and then at the same time squeezing your kegel muscles, the mm -hmm. pelvic floor muscles and then you release. So you squeeze and release. And I just ran into a Tahitian dancer a couple days ago and she was telling me that from the time that she started dancing, she's been doing that. Hmm. Just squeezing and releasing, squeeze all the time. She's on her feet at her job and she just practices doing that to keep her abs tight. Yeah, it's, it's valuable stuff. And, and again, the way you've outlined it here is somewhat different from the sort of standard exercise program, right? In the standard exercise program, you're asked to set aside 20 minutes or 40 minutes or some big chunk of time. But you're saying just slide these just in. Just slide slot, it in, slot that's them right. Into, in just these thousand little times each day when you have a spare 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Or, or not even spare. So right. for example, um, under emotional, one of my favorite exercises in the book is smiling. Mm -hmm. uh, because the research shows that even fake smiling increases the amount of happy hormones in your body. Mm -hmm. So I will smile at work in my cubicle while I'm working on a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Or I'll smile while I'm cooking or while I'm doing laundry or cleaning the house. Mm -hmm. And there's two effects of that. One is that I feel better and it seems to go faster whatever chore I'm doing. And it just you know makes your day better. Yeah. And plus it exercises facial and it muscles. Exercises and your right. face too. It helps right. lift everything. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. so, um, yeah, so a lot of these things you do while you're doing something else. So it doesn't take any extra time. Right. right. And there is a, that whole uh, 
relationship. As you say, we, we sort of think we smile when we're happy, but actually smiling actually makes us happy too. Right, right. Uh, and you know, smiling is so great because if you do it a lot, mm -hmm. as I try to do, well, when I first moved to Hawaii, I smiled all the time, right? Because <laughs> I was hey, so excited. Right. And everyone around me smiled. Right. And then somewhere along the line, I stopped smiling. Mm -hmm. And everyone around me stopped smiling. So since I've been smiling again, mm -hmm. uh, I catch people's eyes mm -hmm. and they smile back. Right. And then sometimes you'll even have a greater connection. I was in this grocery store and I had kind of stopped at the end of the aisle. And this local man came around the corner and I smiled and said hello to him. And I said, oh, let me get out of your way. And he said, no, no, you go first. And I said, no, I can't go. I have to think. He said, oh, you cannot think and walk at the same time. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> so we both laughed right. and he went on. So now I've got even more happy hormones because I've laughed. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's the nice thing. Is this stuff sort of snowballs. Exactly. Right? A bunch of these things, as you start doing them more, they become easier to do. So you do them more. Yeah, and they then have these spin-off effects that they, yeah, the smiling leads to laughing. <coughs> the laugh, and then I go home, tell right. my husband about it, right. so then I'm laughing with him. That deepens our relationship. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there is a real ripple effect. Yeah, it's, it, that's, that's really wonderful stuff. And the, uh, they're, they're really very diverse, the, the kinds of things you talk about here, but they're all appealingly simple, right? There's nothing very complicated about any of them. Yeah, uh, and which is true for, I think, um, the research is showing us that it's not that hard. Like you say, the Blue Zones Project, these are people who are, they're country people, really, mm -hmm. you know, who just live their lives. And, and, you know, I think all of us have it in our genes, right? Mm -hmm. Because our grandparents or their grandparents live this way, too. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of gotten distance from it. But um, another way people can approach it, as some people have told me that they have a lot of time that they spend driving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the average commute time in the United States is 25 minutes each way, and right. it's longer in Hawaii. Right. And so people can um, say, okay, I'm gonna drive. So then they can look at all of the techniques that they can use while driving. So one, for example, um, one of my favorites while I'm driving is a spiritual technique, which is um, to experience awe. Uh, you know, there's research on how important it is to enjoy nature so as we're driving if we savor the color of the sky or the shape of the clouds or the play of the light or rainbows and go ah it's engaging the same part of our brain that's engaged when we pray mm -hmm. so it's giving us a spiritual experience it doesn't take any extra time right and way better than listening to news or talk radio or sitting there fuming at the other drivers on the road who are being idiots right right <laughs> Now, the thing you can do is pray for them. Right. <laughs> that takes a lot of enlightenment, though. Yeah, yeah, right, or be grateful for them that they didn't run you off the road this time. Exactly, or forgive them. Right. Forgiveness is one of the techniques that's right. really important. Yeah, all these things, they really tie and they cross those boundaries a lot, I think, uh, when you, you're doing things that are uh, improving your emotional well-being and they're also sort of helping you mentally. Um, yeah, and it just starts the day off better. I. Um, love to sing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mostly sing to Beatles or, you know, oldies. Mm -hmm. And I went into work one day and I was just really bopping, you know, I was so energetic. And one of my coworkers said, why are you so happy? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I was happy because of that, you know, and so it just spills over into the rest of the day. Right. And then that, that tends to have good impacts on people around you too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, this is amazing. We're going we're gonna to take a little break and then we're going to come back. Uh, McConnell Research Shy is with me today. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen. You're here with us on Likeable Science, and we'll be back in just a moment. My grandmother, what big eyes you have, she said. All the better to see you with, my dear. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the starting line. Push. This is over. You're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day.
And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm Ethan Allen, your host here. And with me today in the Think Tech Studios is McConnell Research High, the author of Be Fit in No Time, a wonderful new book filled with good advice on how to improve your mind, your body, and your spirit, uh, make you emotionally more fit, more balanced. Uh, wonderful, simple, accessible exercises uh, that can be easily integrated into your daily life and uh, help basically create better habits for you and, and make you a better person. So how did you come to write this book? I mean, you, I understand you were, you were being a Pilates coach and a uh, yoga coach and, and those kind of things. Uh, what, what really drove you to, to pull all this together? Well, I've been teaching stress management courses and mm -hmm. I was teaching one one night for busy people mm -hmm. and I was telling them, you need to take time to exercise. You need to take time to relax. You need to take time to meditate. And they started laughing at me. They said, we don't have time. Mm -hmm. We have jobs, we have families, we were caregivers. Right. So I started thinking that night as I drove home, you know, how can I help them? And the idea came to me while I was driving, well, you can meditate while you're driving. Now, don't close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but meditation is really just breathing and focusing your mind, either mm -hmm. on the breath, on a mantra, or on the moment. Mm -hmm. So that was the seed. And then as time went on, I started thinking of more and more things that you could do while you're doing something else. So from the moment that I had the idea to the moment that it was published was just nine months. Wow. That's I know. I've never written a book that quickly. Huh? But um, I just got so excited with the idea, you know, because I wanted to help people who say we don't have time and give them a way to have time to make a difference. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really critical issue that, because people don't feel they have time. I mean, we all have the same 24 hours every day, mm -hmm. but people are finding they're doing more and more and more these days, particularly here in Hawaii where lots of people work two or three jobs just to yes. sort of survive. And yes, more people are now finding themselves caring for older parents or caring for kids or whatever it may be. And you know, so on top of their two or three jobs and they feel they just simply don't have any time. So this, I, I think you hit a really beautiful niche here. And you can be taking care of your kids and be doing some of these at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a part-time caregiver, and I know sometimes it's very easy to get impatient um, with an elder who keeps repeating the same thing over and over again. But if I can repeat to myself positive affirmations, mm -hmm. then it doesn't get to me. You know, I don't get um, impatient or right. annoyed. Right. I've been doing a little bit of uh, gratitude journaling, not oh. quite as consistently as I should be, but uh, my wife and I started that a while ago at her, at her urging and found it to be a very good thing. We've sort of dropped it off now and want to get it back into, it, into that uh -huh. routine. Are you on Facebook? We are. So I do mine on Facebook. Ooh, wow. So every night I write down three things that I'm grateful for on Facebook. And I'm not doing it for anybody necessarily to see, but I'm already there, huh. so it's not a different thing. And I, um, the gratitude practice I learned is that it has to be three different things mm -hmm. every single day because otherwise the sunset would right. be there, the sunrise right. would be there every right. day. So you have to really think sometimes. Mm -hmm. But after I'd been doing it for maybe about six months, one day I was um, cleaning the house and I had a deep clean. So this was like four hours into it. All of a sudden the thought popped into my head, I'm grateful I have a house to clean. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of thing where you really start looking, or just today driving here, um, I saw some pink blossoms on the road that were dancing across the road in the wind, you know, and they reminded me of fairies, <laughs> you know, so yeah. that'll go on my list tonight. No, it's great, it's great. And once you start paying attention to these positive things, you, you see more of them around you then, right? You, you, your attention becomes more focused on that kind of thing, and therefore, you see more of it, you have more reasons to be happy, to be grateful. Yeah. You are less distracted by the bad news or the, the news. <laughs> yes, yeah, in fact, one of the things that in the back of the book are some ideas for getting more time, mm -hmm. and one of them is to do less news uh, because it's, um, there's nothing we can do about it, you know? 
when I lived in Chicago for a number of years, I would get the morning paper. And eventually I had to stop because it was sort of like each day it was a, it was a contest to see what new low can human <laughs> beings sink to, you know? What more disgusting, <laughs> awful, wretched thing can they do? And I, I found it was just, it was just terrible. It was, it was sort of ruining my day each day to, to, to pick up the newspaper and see some other appalling human act. Uh, yes, I too watched, the, the, read the paper every day. And when I moved here, I stopped. And now as part of my job, I need to look at headlines, but that's all I do is look at headlines, and if there's something related to my job, then I pull it out. But otherwise, um, it's like, okay, you know, I got the overview, it took me 10 minutes, you know, instead of an hour. I mean, there is a very interesting tension here because we live in certainly interesting political times, shall we say, and not normal political times. And a lot of people feel with some justification that we can't ignore this stuff and pretend it's all normal. It, right. it, we all have some obligation to pay some attention to it and be sure that we're reacting appropriately to whatever uh, crisis is occurring. Yeah, so, I, so it's very, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, my philosophy is rather than focusing on you know, what's going on out there is to work really close to home. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been volunteering with IHS, the um, Institute for Human Services that works with people who are homeless. Mm -hmm. And all I'm doing, it's really nothing, but um, it's something, is um, they have a jobs program. And so I write resumes for people who are homeless who are looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. And I do you know, usually two or three a month, mm -hmm. but um, it's my way of helping. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I give donations to mm -hmm. various local charities um, because I think that's important too. Okay, well that's good, yeah. Again, I'm sure that kind of stuff has good Im inputs, impacts on people. Uh, I suspect you get a certain amount of good feedback from the, the people who you write Yeah, resumes. and, it's, and uh, the jobs program is actually really good. They, get, um, they place between 15 and 20 people a month hmm. in jobs. So, hmm. um, it, and it puts a face to people who are homeless. Right. So again, that's that emotional connection, you know, that I can see people who are homeless on the street and I see them more as human beings who've fallen on hard times. Sure, it's all too easy to set those barriers up with particular people who, for whatever reason, you feel some distance from. Right, exactly. Uh, but, but even just other people in a store, it's, it's all too easy just to get into sort of zoning them out, putting them behind some sort of psychic fence, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah we just get, we put blinders on, I think. Right. And um, so connecting, I think connecting with people emotionally you know, the clerk in the store, getting to know their names yeah. and, you know, finding out a little bit about them or at least just saying hi and trying to make their, their day a little bit better. Right. I remember years ago, I heard this speaker talk about how are you going to be remembered when you die? And I thought, you know, I think what's more important is how am I going to be remembered today? Like, is someone going to go home and tell their family, oh, I met this horrible person today, right. you know, are you going to be the horror story, right. story of somebody's day, or are you going to be the happy story right. of somebody's day? No, and, and that connection, is a, it's an amazing thing to watch. Uh, my wife, uh, Thea, has this ability to connect very quickly with people, mm -hmm. and I've seen this countless times in, we'll be standing in a line in a, in a grocery store or something, and the person in front of us will just turn around and just start talking to her. Oh. And she responds, and within sometimes 30 seconds, this person will open up and start telling her amazingly deep things about themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, telling her things about the life that she may not even want to know. <laughs> but it's, it's really uh, that ability to establish it. I, I'm always sort of in awe of, of that when I see it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, just thinking about, we had talked earlier about commuting and driving, and you know, so much of us spend so much of our time driving and so a couple other things I wanted to share sure. because um, they're easy to do and again don't take any time. Um, one thing we can do while we're driving is facial yoga. Actually you hmm. can do that almost any time in your cubicle, uh, in the bathroom, taking a shower. Um, so facial yoga is just trying to open up and use the face. So mm -hmm. there's all different techniques in the book but one is just to go through the vowels. Mm -hmm. So you say A, A, E, uh, I, I, O, U, U, and that just kind of opens up. Sure. Um, or another one is go, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and all those things 
push your facial muscles out, out of a normal sort of fixed position. Right, and, right. And really help, the, I mean, one, it is burning small amounts of calories. It's keeping you active. It's getting more blood circulation going. It's keeping mm -hmm. those muscles more toned up. So it is. And then, you know, using, you can stretch your arms, you know, mm -hmm. instead of, I don't know about you, but I have this tendency to really mm -hmm. hang on. And actually, I learned this part of my research is, um, I don't know about you, but I learned you're supposed to keep your hands at 10 and 3 on the, 10 or 10 and 2. It was a classic. Right. And now they're saying 9 and 3. Right. So um, already you're having your shoulders reduced mm -hmm. or relaxed more. But if at the same time, especially if you're just sitting there, if you can you know, stretch out one and stretch out the other, or you can bring your elbow up one side and up the other, then you're, um, you know, you're stretching. Right, right. And you're keeping, again, that kind of movement keeps you from sort of zoning out and kind of getting right. sort, of, sort of lost, right. which is a bad thing. And then we did mention breathing, but uh, I w wanted to mention the science, you know, because people think deep breathing, that's so um, new age. But um, it's, there's research, the research oh. shows that deep breathing reduces blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It normalizes blood sugar levels. It decreases stress, and it helps you think better right. because you've got more oxygen in your brain. So just three deep breaths are enough to start that process going. Right, yeah, and it actually stretches your, your abdomen and, and, again, sort of works on the, on the whole chest, core. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can actually combine that with your abdomen exercise. Mm -hmm. So when you breathe in, you relax your abdomen, mm -hmm. and then when you exhale, you pull your mm -hmm. belly in and down mm -hmm. towards the floor. Mm -hmm and then breathe in and relax. Hmm. So now you're doing two things at once. Yeah, no, this, this is wonderful. Uh, this has been great, this is wonderful. I, I, I highly, highly, highly recommend this book, uh, Be Fit in No Time, McConnell Research Try, available on Amazon Correct. Uh, and probably elsewhere. But, uh, and it's, it's an astounding book. Uh, oh, thank and you. I, I think you've done a real service for getting science out into the community and it's been a, been a real pleasure having you here on Likeable Science. I thank you very much, and I, I wish you the best of luck uh, going forward, and hope you sell a million copies of it. <laughs> thank you, too, because if I do, that means a million people got helped. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Makana. Thank you, Ethan. Take care. This is Ethan Allen signing off from another episode of Likeable Science. Makana Research Eye has been with me today here at Think Tech Hawaii. See you next week.